I want to thank as well and ask all of our elected officials, and I know we have uh, several of you here, to please stand and allow us to recognize you uh, for your service to our community. And Beth White was here as well, I know, back over there. Bob Cochran. And uh, thank you both for uh, being here. I also want to recognize uh, we have uh, three trustees that I know for sure from Indiana and Purdue universities. And I'd ask the trustee Riley, trustee Eskew, and trustee Harden. And if I missed that trustee, please stand and let us recognize all of you for your service. I have a number of uh, my colleagues on the campus, the leadership, the vice chancellors that and deans that are here, as well as uh, University Vice President Morrison, and I may have another colleague, and I'd ask all the campus leadership and the university leadership uh, to please stand and be recognized. I also want to take this opportunity uh, to remind you that just last year was our 40th anniversary. And in the course of that celebration, we recognized with the Founders Medallion a group of individuals who made an enormous difference to our community by being responsible for founding IUPUI in many, many different ways they contributed. And we are very privileged to have with us today three of those people we recognized, and I want to ask them to stand. Roselle Boyd from the City County Council. Uh, We have also Ned Lampkin, who's here with his wife, uh, Martha, who served us at Lumina for, as a founding president. But Ned, please stand as one of the Founders Medal. And we're also pleased to have with us uh, former Senator, Re Senator Emeritus, Larry Borst. Please stand, Dr. Borst. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for what you've done. And I also must recognize one of the founders and builders of IUPUI. We are privileged to have with us today the second chancellor of IUPUI, the former dean of the School of Medicine, uh, Chancellor Emeritus, Glenn Irwin. Thank you, Glenn, for coming. When people mention retirement, I point out that to my memory as Glenn retired in 1986, and he doesn't come quite every day, but I followed him most days uh, for many years coming down to campus. And it is a role model of what retirement's about in terms of continued service. So thank you, Glenn, for that and all you've done for the campus. The celebration of the 40th anniversary was a reminder to all of us, and some of you heard me make this remark, that even in tough times, like 1968, people here in this community had a vision that they had to build a better city, a better state, and a better nation. They set forward and established IUPUI in that year and launched us in 1969. That was the kind of vision I think that we must have today as we look at the budget that we're facing and have been facing the last several years. So while I'm going to be mostly celebratory, I've also got to start with the facts, and that is... The economy, I know this is a shock to Gary Dick, is bad. <laughs> the state's budgeted revenue in the first three months of this fiscal year, I know this is a shock, is down. And the next several months have been down as well. As a result, the state has done what they should do. They've cut our budget. Now listen, I just said they should do this. I happen to believe in fiscal conservatism. You don't spend what you don't have. And so my colleagues on this campus have gone ahead and made the base budget cuts that were required, even though we did not know until December that we were likely to actually have to make them fully in this fiscal year. That work is done. We've also made the cuts for the next fiscal year, so that we've already cut $10.5 million out of our base budget as an, on an ongoing basis from this campus. And that has occurred because my colleagues, the deans and the vice chancellors, took a look at our, their share of the responsibility. They eliminated positions. They cut travel. They made plans to go forward with less money coming in from the state. 
That was the facts. That's our approach at IUPUI is we don't cover up the tough times. We look at it. But at the same time, we followed the lead of President McRobbie and said, we have to keep building for the future. We have to hire faculty and we have to build facilities so that we have them for the future. And I want you to know it's a great time to hire faculty in this country and deans. We have just managed to find, I thought it was going to be impossible to replace. We can't ever replace. To have a good successor for Larry Goldblatt as Dean of the School of Dentistry, and we've managed to snag a two-time Dean of Dentistry who we have got to come from one of the top research universities in the United States, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We've also hired in all the schools amazingly talented people. A mathematician just this week crossed my desk, an amazing person who does work in the life sciences with his mathematics. We've seen them one after another because we, our colleagues have been committed. So yes, we cut our budget. But yes, we've said we're going to move resources to build the talent that we have to have for the future. It's that commitment to the future that's essential. And you're going to see that as a theme in my remarks. So while we also recognize we could have another cut, and if I were a betting person, I'd be betting on another cut because the economy still hasn't turned around. Although I did have a report from one of my specialty agents that people are showing up at Castleton big time on Valentine's Day and buying things. <laughs> and I'm glad to hear that, I want you to know. Uh, when I lived in Detroit, I used to go around and tell people to buy cars. Uh, and frankly, given sales tax, I preferred certain cars over others, but all cars people paid sales tax on. Uh, and uh, we are seeing some turn, but it's not there yet. So as I say that, I want you to keep that as the backdrop. We're dealing with tough times, but we cannot let that stop us. That is our obligation. Our colleagues who were the founders didn't let the, that decade stop them. They didn't let the faculty and staff who served stop them. We have to keep moving forward. That is essential to us because we are an anchor institution in Indianapolis. We're not leaving. We're here. It's essential for us to be successful, as well as our colleagues in the other universities in our community. And I'm pleased that Beverly Pitts, the president of the University of Indianapolis, joined us today, as did the president of Ivy Tech and the chancellor of I Ivy Tech Indianapolis, as well as the provost of Ivy Tech, the system. All of you are anchor institutions with us. We are essential to the future. The CEOs for Cities group, of which my colleague Brian Payne and I uh, are members for representing Indianapolis, believe that four characteristics make great cities and make for success. You have to have talent. You have to have innovation. You have to be connected among the people and among the institutions. And you have to be distinctive. Now, I'm not going to give you this whole speech because that slide is a 45-minute address. I'm simply going to say I'm going to talk about talent and I have to announce to you news about distinction. Brian Payne was supposed to be here today. He called me last night and said, I have news you can't tell anybody until tomorrow morning after 10 o'clock. Congressman Carson called him yesterday and said, and it's been announced about 40 minutes ago, that Indianapolis application for $20 million to complete the cultural trail was approved. <laughs> Andre Lacey was here earlier uh, to join us but left for that announcement because Andre is the co-chair of the fundraising and he gave us the detail to John Harden and I. Uh, the goal was $55 million. This, they were short only 12. This means they're going to take over, they're going to go over their goal which creates the endowment so that they will be able to endow the maintenance of the cultural trail. So what we're gaining here, for those of you who are not cultural trail people, is we will have a signature of Indianapolis of over eight miles of bike, walking paths, looping the downtown area, coming through IUPUI from the Urban League's front door, coming down Blackford, past the Heron School of Art, past the informatics building and the law school building and going to the canal and looping back around, connected to the Lilly Company, connected to Fountain Square, connected up past Mass Avenue. 
this is going to be something we are known for. So when you say a distinctive city, we are now adding to our sports, to our academic institutions, to our cultural institutions, we're adding the cultural trail. Truly an example of a legacy, as its title says, of Eugene and Marilyn Glick. And that today was the great news of one of our distinctions for Indianapolis. I'm going to focus on talent. This shouldn't surprise anyone. Universities are about talent. We hire talent, whether they're administrators, faculty, or staff. We recruit students to our campus with the support of, like the Lilly Scholarships, as you heard Capri open. She's one of those students who came to us with that scholarship. We try and grow talent by bringing them to our campus and educating them in partnership sometimes with other institutions, whether they're transferring from Ivy Tech, whether they're moving on for a physical therapy degree at the University of Indianapolis. We want to import talent and we want to grow our own. That's the only way we get talent. You can't, like, make them in a chemistry lab. You've got to have these people. And so a city is essential to that. And that's why that distinctiveness is important and innovativeness and so forth. But I'm going to talk a story about talent and why this is so important to us and how it fits what we've done in the last year. This is my favorite slide of the year, okay? Now, you've got to take a look at this. I'll get you oriented. The axis, for those of you who are not mathematically inclined, that would be the one in the center going up and down, okay? <laughs> Forgive me, Ude. But I don't assume everyone is like the executive vice chancellor and is uh, good with these things. That's the vertical axis. It says at the top, high sticky states, and at the bottom it says low sticky states. That refers to whether or not people who are there, born there, like me in South Dakota, stay there. And the answer for South Dakota is, we leave. <laughs> All three of my mother and father's children do not live in South Dakota. We all left. Now, we're not the worst. I want to point out Alaska. The lower right-hand corner, it appears to me if you're born there, you leave if you're probably not a Native American. But Wyoming is low, South Dakota, North Dakota, those states, and notice Nevada does not retain people. High sticky states. The hardest recruiting job I've ever done to recruit any human being in my life was a native-born Texan named Cristina Maria Gonzalez. A Latina, multi-generation Texan. It took three years. I pestered this woman for three years at every conference. I encourage her to think, to, and I'm trying to recruit her not to Indiana, to Arizona. It wasn't like I was trying to get her to go to South Dakota. It was a desert, just like West Texas. You see why? Nobody leaves. They're the highest sticky state. California, most of you know how hard it is to get people out of California who were born there. It's just like prying them out. Recessions help, by the way. But North Carolina, I didn't know about. But look at those at the top. Hard to get people to move from those states who were born there. The other axis, the, vertic the, the horizontal axis, is whether or not states are a magnet. Do they draw people to them? Or do people, in fact, not go there? Like Louisiana and New York, my wife will be shocked, is not a magnet state. She liked growing up in New York, but she left, so she's one of those why New York's below the line, and it doesn't attract people. Look at the far right, however. Florida, Arizona are incredible magnets along with Nevada and Alaska. Now, I happen to have moved with Sandra to Arizona. I can speak to the fact everybody moved there. I had a running bet going how many years it would take before I met a person my age who was born in Arizona. And I think I gave up counting at five years. I actually thought I'd met somebody. She was older than I was. And it turned out she moved in 1912, the year it became a state. 
at two years of age. Okay? There were 100,000 people in Phoenix in 1940. There are over 2 million people there now. Everybody moved there. And that's why you see that magnet. Now get that... In. So this means if you're going to import talent and you're not in the far right side, you've got a bigger challenge. We're not an automatic magnet state. Notice we're in the upper quadrant on the left. Cities are different than the whole state. I don't have this for cities, by the way. And we're, frankly, a pretty positive place to recruit to. But also notice whether we keep people. So we're above in Indiana, but we're not at the top. This is not like Texas, where people just don't want to leave. So we have to work at this, whether we're growing them and trying to keep them or attracting them. So that's the framework that I'm working with here and I want you to think about. So if we're going to get talent, we're going to try and recruit to our community. We're going to try and grow talent. The CEOs for cities did an analysis and said, why is this so important? You're sitting there saying, sounds good. Why does this matter really? Where's the number? So they hired an economist who said, let's take the 51 largest cities in America and let's raise the college graduation rate and the high school graduation rate and the postgraduate rate 1%. 1% difference. And what that means in those 51 cities every year is $124 billion in increased annual income because education increases annual income. So the stakes are serious financial. Not just that I need to recruit people to be the faculty, not just that I want our students to succeed. These are the stakes. And we can even take that down to Indianapolis. Our high school or college attainment rate is basically 30%. The chart at the very top, which you can't read, is Washington, D.C. in the metro area. They're huge. They have good schools. They have a lot of ways to keep people, and they recruit enormous number of young people who are educated to the metro area. You do not want to be in Riverside, California. That's the lowest one, and Las Vegas is right above it. it is in, both are incredibly undereducated communities. Uh, we are in the middle on that chart. So our goal is going to be in talent, to get a talent dividend, is we want to shift the distribution of people's education. We want people to finish high school. We want them to get associate degrees. We want them to get baccalaureate degrees. We want law degrees. We want graduate degrees. We want to move everybody. IUPUI is essential to this effort in central Indiana. And we are, for reasons I'll explain very clearly, but realize we not only are busy here in the baccalaureate, at the center, the peak of that, we are the place that produces the most advanced degrees in the state. If you want a physician, you look to the Indiana University School of Medicine. It's the only school of medicine. If you want a dentist, you look to the dental school at Indiana University because 85% of the dentists are from there. We are essential in terms of MBA production, MPA production, social work production. I mean, you can just go through the whole list. Now, where that it becomes really apparent as you look at this and say, how can IUPUI help? We have in Indianapolis, 20, in the metro area, 20, 293,000 people with some college but no baccalaureate degree. They might have an associate degree. They might have some. We have almost as many people like that as with baccalaureate plus. So we have an opportunity to help finish those students as well as obviously bring students out of high school and get those number of students who, to complete baccalaureate degrees. All we need in the baccalaureate measure alone is 11,000 more students and we'll raise our percentage 1%. To give you a scale, when I came in 2003, we were giving 2,200 baccalaureate degrees. So 11,000 is literally five years of our production in 2003. I challenged us to double our numbers. We're up over 30%. We're on our way. If we double, we will literally produce those 11,000 in five years. We can do this. And the difference it will make 
is $1.3 billion if we move that whole curve. And to give you a scale, I've been told that's approximately the payroll of Eli Lilly and Company in central Indiana. So this is serious work. Now it's not just those 11,000. We've got to move the whole curve. We've got to get more high school. We've got to get more associates. We've got to get more professional graduate degrees. But we can do this. And we can do it, I believe, in part because IUPUI has the students who are from Indiana. We have, this spring, just under 28,000 Hoosier students on our campus. 95% of our undergraduates are from Indiana. Frankly, I want to grow the pie and grow a larger number of non-residents from international and other states. But we will always have an enormously disproportionate of our population is from Indiana. Similarly, notice our graduate professional. Most of our medical students, dental students, social work students in the graduate programs are residents. Now, why is that so important? Remember, we only get talent two ways. We import them or we grow our own. We are responsible for growing our own. 28,000 people are residents of Indiana. That's our responsibility here, and we have to keep graduating them. Our alums also stay here. This is our baccalaureate and graduate alums and where they live right now. And you see 70% of our undergraduates live in Indiana and 63% of our graduate professional, which sounds pretty big, but sounds even bigger when you realize that physician who graduated in 1958 that we had lunch with in Florida, Liz and I, lives in Florida, but practiced his entire career in Fort Wayne. He retired to Florida. He's counted as a non-resident even though he spent his entire time in, when he was working here. So the impact of our graduates is tremendous on our state. We can, in fact, change this needle. We grow our own. Steve Eckhart is a good example of this here, has a liberal arts degree from this campus and then got a JD and an MBA. He spent a few years around the world in the Foreign Service, and so what's he doing now for the state? Recruiting international business for IEDC. This is an example, we grew it, we let him go away for a while and we reeled him back in to our home state. And he's making a difference by importing businesses, in fact. We have to, when we grow our own, educate them, we've got to help them be successful, get into college, finish college and move on. We also have to help on the economic development side. We've got to, in fact, create a quality of life that retains students, and their graduates creates work opportunities and educational opportunities. Those of you in business have told me over and over, our educational programs are one of the strategies you use to keep people here. They can come and get a night degree and stay working with you. That's one of our advantages here. So I'm going to focus the rest of my remarks around the four themes that we're going to be talking about for the next several years in the, cam the next campaign for IUPUI called the Impact Campaign. We're going to focus on student success. We're going to focus on health and life sciences. We're going to focus on our contributions as an urban public research university campus. And we're going to focus on civic engagement. And I'm going to illustrate this year, and I'm going to go through these really quick because otherwise I will stop and tell you about each one, and I can't do that. This is the part that frustrates me because there's so many good examples here, but I'm going to give you highlights. First thing, student success. One of our key partners are sitting here, and along with Tom Snyder, here today is Ivy Tech. Ivy Tech has grown into a comprehensive community college that helps serve the state and central Indiana, and they have been our partner now for nearly 20 years in a program where we refer students to them and we try and bring them back to get degrees. We're strengthening that right now, and we're doing it in two distinct ways. First, this program called Bridges to the Baccalaureate, a federally funded program for the National Sciences uh, Foundation, and from the Le Eli Lilly and Company Foundation. This is designed to take students in science at Ivy Tech and put them at, to research projects in laboratories on our campus. That, we know, gets students engaged. It gets them involved. It keeps them focused on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math degrees. 
and helps them become successful. This is one of the key things we have to do in Indiana. We have to create those STEM students. We have to get them out of Ivy Tech and make sure they don't hesitate, take too much time off, not continue and finish their degrees. We've got to do this. And Andy Gavin and his colleagues have raised money to do this. They've created this program. It's a tremendously focused program. The second thing is what I'm pleased to announce today for the first time that we're establishing a scholarship program for Ivy Tech and Vincennes graduates who come to IUPUI within one year of getting their associate's degree. We will support them with a scholarship of $1,500 on an annual basis for up to four semesters. This is... Thank you. We want students to succeed. We know one of the critical places is when they finish something. Do they move across that transition successfully? Financial aid will help that. We know that. We know it's important to us. And it also helps Ivy Tech who tells students, finish your associate's degree. Now they have another thing to say is if you finish then you're eligible for this scholarship. So we did it as a way to try and increase the tightness of our partnership and to encourage students to finish both the associate and the baccalaureate degree. And so that's another example of this kind of partnership. The other end of this process is the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, which I hope you've heard about before and I'll touch on lightly. Pat Rogan, who's here today, uh, has been critical in that program. This, the governor took a lead along with the Lilly Endowment in their support for this program. This is for people who are returning after having gotten degrees to get a teaching certificate and have a master's program in a very intensive period with a fellowship named the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship uh, that is supported uh, at $30,000 a year. We launched that program. Uh, three programs, were, campuses did this this year with a total of 59 students. Uh, our colleagues at UIndy are involved in this program as well as West Lafayette this year and uh, we have 20 students. These are amazingly talented people. Uh, I was fortunate the governor included me in meeting the first cohort uh, of people and you sat with them and it was just dazzling how talented these people were and I want you to know that they weren't all 22. There was at least one person who was my age uh, in this group. I was glad to see that there is life after uh, my age doing a new career uh, and that kind of focus. It's a great program and I want to thank Pat and the team that's done this so rapidly. I've emphasized the STEM education so much because we have a fundamental responsibility as Indiana's health and life science campus. We're not alone in that. We don't create veterinary medicine, for example, or pharmacy on our campus. We have support in other disciplines uh, from other campuses, but we produce the majority of the health science workers in this state. And so we have a huge responsibility there. And a key of that is, of course, science Mathematics, engineering, education is preparation. We are making a key element in this year has been to develop a school of public health. We are not there yet. We have a department of public health led by Marie Swanson, the photo in the middle there. Marie is working extremely assiduously, if that's appropriate to say, and has uh, been successful in putting a grant to the Eli Lilly Company Foundation. We're working with others who want to support us in this. The campus has made a financial commitment to this. We have faculty moving together and we will methodically launch a school under the accreditation guidelines over the next several years. This is important because we have serious public health problems in this state. Uh, those of you in the room who know those data uh, know that they put us in the bottom half of the country in terms of issues like cancer and smoking and diabetes and so forth. And public health is an important piece of our efforts to improve that. You see some of the great work that's already being done. Sean Granis, who's in the School of Medicine, uh, got a huge grant for public health informatics, one of the four in the entire country. And we see one of our students who graduated from SPIA in public health a few years ago, uh, 2008, who works with Native Americans, uh, worked initially in New Mexico and is now in Alaska, one of those people who moved to Alaska. And we hope to, of course, to recruit back for a master's degree uh, in public health. Uh, the next one is a very big one, and I'm pleased that uh, David Wilkes is here in person over here at the side, and as well as large on the screen. 
uh, David Wilkes and Craig Brader and a team in the School of Medicine put together a proposal that was very successful with our friends at the Lilly Endowment in December. This was announced. Physician Scientist Initiative is to recruit people to Indianapolis to work at the School of Medicine who are both clinicians practicing and scientists who are taking their scientific work and translating it into practice in their own work and spreading that news. This is an enormous opportunity to import talent to the campus and simultaneously grow talent because remember the students are going to work with these physician scientists and they'll have that opportunity. It was a tremendous idea. I was so pleased that the endowment uh, was receptive to the proposal that our colleagues put forward. The Glick Eye Institute, uh, several of you were here when we announced that. Uh, and that's the groundbreaking ceremony with Eugene and Marilyn Glick in the center and Craig Brader on your right and uh, Ora Peskovitz on your left. Uh, that is coming out of the ground. If you happen to go west on uh, Michigan, on the right side, just past uh, the cancer hospital, you'll see a, a, train, a crane, uh, the blue crane. That is, in fact, uh, the Glick Eye Institute and the foundation is almost done in the, to the ground level. Uh, and this is going to be another translational example. They're bringing together both basic science and research and clinical practice in the same facility. Uh, Gene and Marilyn were enormously generous with the $20 million for the building and a $10 million endowment gift, which was so important to our efforts. Uh, urban Public Research Campus, the third theme that I want to talk about, builds, of course, off the health and life science. We serve our community. I reminded people last fall that 99% of the physicians at Wishard are members of the faculty of the School of Medicine. That is a key part of our urban mission in terms of providing health, and that partnership has been very important to us. You probably can't read the detail above the slide here. This is Ransom Place Archaeology. One of the ways we do our work is that we do archaeology. Paul Mullins here in our neighborhood, they actually, Paul did a dig under this building uh, back before it was built, and he's done one in Ransom Place, and he may right now is far more famous for his book on donuts and particularly including Long's Donuts, for those of you aficionado. Glazed America is the title of the book. The Signature Center Initiative is a perfect illustrate of our research responsibilities, and Uday Sakatmi, the Executive Vice Chancellor, led this initiative, and this was a competition on the campus to get seed money to support research centers that had to be interdisciplinary and had to be focused on an area which we had the potential to become a, a national or international leader, truly signatures of our campus. This effort has produced signature centers, 27 of them across the disciplines in, of course, the health and life sciences, but as you see in the humanities and social sciences as well. Uh, this is a great example. The Religion and American Culture Center uh, is a signature center. Uh, this is something you may not know is one of the signatures of the campus. We have a fabulous program in American religion on this campus. Uh, Phil Goff and his colleagues, and you see here Ed Curtis and his book on Muslims in America. This is one thing that we are known for around the world. Uh, probably, I think, some days more than we are known for it in Indianapolis. But the Signature Center initiative is working. These centers are supposed to support themselves after three years with outside funds. And it, this has been one of the great initiatives, I think, in our academic plan. Similarly, we work in translating research into practice uh, as part of our urban mission. Uh, I've talked to you before, many of you, about uh, the Vera Bradley Chair in Oncology that's held by Linda Malkus there on the left and her husband, Bob Hickey. Uh, the Vera, Vera Bradley gave a gift to start that chair of about a million and a half dollars uh, nearly 10 years ago, and they, they were fortunate to recruit Linda here. Uh, she brought Bob. They brought a team. They started an enterprise which has grown every single year, and they spun out a company called CS Keys uh, with a diagnostic tool uh, that Gary, in fact, uh, interviewed them on uh, the show, uh, Linda on his show about a year ago, as I remember. And this is a great example. Basic research turning into practice to diagnose breast cancer early on. Uh, and they are also a great example of importing talent, bringing them here, and now they're bringing through students and growing students here, as well as still recruiting nationally other students. 
Our best example this year, a wonderful win in our urban research mission in technology transfer, is angel learning. And I hope all of you know of this, but I'm going to take a moment and tell you because this is one of the great stories. Ali Jafari on the right there is a professor in our School of Engineering and Technology. Ali has been someone who's worked on creating software to teach online for more than a decade. He works always with students and he created what he calls the Cyber Lab and he brings students in and the goal of the Cyber Lab is to do basic work but always has in mind an outcome that's commercially usable. So he worked on the very first pro software that the university used and that was an internal effort and then he and David Mills, a student at the time, worked on what became known as Angel Learning, a piece of software the company spun out of the university. The university wisely held the share of it. Uh, David and Ali held shares because Ali made David an equal owner uh, with, Dave, with uh, himself as part of the creation, a student uh, who became an employee. Uh, David worked for the company. Ali didn't. So David ended up, I understand, with more shares. And the company was sold this year for $100 million. So not only did those two inventors get the reward of their intellectual property, Indiana University benefited from this. And I'm pleased that the School of Engineering and Technology has $4.1 million in investment capital to support its work. And President McRobbie this month announced that he was going to commit $5 million of the university's share to support the construction of a building focused on the investment in engineering, but the building will also support our School of Sciences effort. So here we are, technology transfer, because someone said we are supposed to create things that can be used, that can be turned into practice. And Ali, by the way, has another company called Epsilon. And if you go on the New York Times, and try and interact with the New York Times, you'll notice it says in the corner, Epsilon, a product of the New York Times. Excuse me, that would be a product of Ali Jafari and another student. And he's not done because his goal is to start an endowment for CyberLab to create scholarships in partnership with us for the future. This is the spirit that Roland talked about of trying to always move forward and create jobs, opportunity, education, growing our own here at IUPUI. Finally, uh, you heard in my bio mention that I'm involved in the President's Trust, trying to emphasize the fact that even as I am a person for economic development, I'm a liberal education person because I believe the successful people in our communities have had a background that involves liberal education. That is that core part of our education that gives us analytic skills, that it helps us understand cultures, that helps us be able to write. All of those pieces in liberal education are so essential for our civic involvement as well as our economic success. And that message is one that we at IUPUI, I believe, illustrate dramatically in our role, which is a perfect transition to civic engagement. And this is easy for me to talk about to you because you are our partners in this. As I look around the room, I could go to every single table that I've seen and say, one of you partner with us in civic engagement in a variety of ways. We are known for this nationally, and frankly, we deserve to be known for it nationally because you have made us such good partners. We have done this in many ways, but our newest way is one, again, from the academic plan and the effort of Dr. Sukotny, is the RISE initiative. We have said we want every student to have a RISE experience, a research learning experience, an international experience, a service experience, or an experiential experience. And so I gave you one of the really fun experiential ones. Frank Tai is an undergraduate who then got a graduate degree as well from us. He did an inter internship at Pixar, which is the incredible lab that produces all those animated things in most of the movies that are so successful these days. And guess what? He finished his master's degree as well as his bachelor's degree, and they hired him. 
So here we have, he had that amazing learning experience through experiential, but he also got a career out of it. And, of course, because he was in a degree program with liberal education, he got that background that we need to have. Similarly, we have partnered in strategic alliances. Uh, I meant to warn Marjorie that she was going to be a very big photo here. Uh, Marjorie Lyles, our colleague at the, who's back at uh, one of the tables with Joe Shu. Uh, this is our partnership we want to emphasize this year with Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou, China. Uh, we have had, all of you know, a strategic alliance with Moy University in El Duret, Kenya, now for four years almost. It built on the program established in medicine, which is a fabulous program that all of you I know know with the AMPATH program. But now we have virtually every school on our campus involved in El Duret at Moy University. What our goal is with Sun Yat-sen is to have the same kind of relationship, building on two pieces that we have well established. One is the work that Marjorie has done with the, one of the business schools at Sun Yat-sen. And if any of you are mid-sized businesses interested in learning how to work in Guangdong province, Marjorie just finished the report on how to do that and can provide advice specifically on how to do that. In addition to that, we have a partnership with the Sun Yat-sen and the Chinese government for a Confucius Center. And uh, sitting next to Marjorie is Joe Xu, who is actually a neuroscientist, but chairs that, is the director of the Confucius Institute. And we're trying to build a strong partnership. And so in December of this year, I signed an agreement with President Wan to establish a strategic alliance with one of China's greatest universities, certainly its best medical school, uh, in order to build this across. This is going to be another enormous opportunity for our students, faculty and staff, to have an international experience and change their lives. It is also, for those of you in the economic development world, Guangdong province is the economic engine of China right now. Uh, it is astonishing, their economic development and production numbers, especially thanks to Marjorie's report, I know this, in electronics, uh, huge productivity in that part of China. About how we engage in best practices and enhance our diversity, because that is a key part of our engagement in Indianapolis. And here I want to give just one example of our Indiana Business Opportunity Fair and the team involved in that. This is our team who's tried to grow our minority business and women-owned business involvement in IUPUI and Indiana University broadly. This group has set, following state set goals, they've moved the campus close to our goals from the state and just recently had an enormous success. We're doing a building project in, for the Multicultural Center and they doubled their expectations on minority and women involvement in that remodeling project. And that is an area, frankly, we needed enormous improvement as a university, and it's a big win. And Rob Halter, who's third from the left in that slide, has been head of purchasing here and, and in fact, head of the state's minority association uh, purchasing and made a big difference in this area. So we really thank them for doing this because it has made such a difference to our community. I want to wrap up by telling you about a few awards, and I'm going to be brief because I'm going to be self-controlled. Uh, we got another award from the President of the United States for our service involvement, community service. Second time we've been on the honor roll. Some of you remember several years ago, the first year they gave awards uh, for an entire campus. We won the only research university award uh, that was given that year, the very first year. We continue to be recognized nationally at the highest level for the work we do in partnership with you. We've also won awards for improving our processes. We've won awards for our outreach. We've won awards in other areas. But to end, the one that I always love to mention is the one that they started just last year, which is what universities are up and coming. And I love this because those of us who fill it out get a blank spot in the U.S. news. And it says, what universities are up and coming? And Dr. Sukatni and I get it, as well as the admissions director on our campus, and this happens at all the big universities in America. And so there's no queue. This is just open-ended. And last year I reported to you with some pride that we were on the list. Now, that was a big deal if your name is Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Getting on a list and for someone to remember you, you have to be smart enough to suddenly become IUPUI. And we are IUPUI nationally. That's all we are. We focus on that. 
and we were 14 on that list. And I was so pleased as a graduate of Ohio State to be able to say we tied with Ohio State, which has 20,000 more students and had a big football team. <laughs> I'm pleased to report to you, we moved up to number seven. Ohio... Ohio State slid to 15. <laughs> and I spent 14 years in the Pac-10 conference, and I was pleased to see we're ahead of the University of Southern California, which is an up-and-coming university. This is a group I want to be a part of. And that has happened because the faculty, staff, and students on our campus have demonstrated the energy and commitment to day in, day out, make this a better place and partner with you. We're known because we are unique in our commitment to not only the highest level academic research, the highest level learning, but we're also known for the highest level commitment to our community for civic engagement. All three and I think we represent, in most people's minds, what the universities are supposed to be in campuses, in cities. We're like that. And we should be proud of that. So I'm going to end with something that some of you have seen. You've seen more of me this year than ever in your life or mine. Because Amy Conrad Warner's team and Troy Brown told me that we needed to let people know who are over 35, that IUPUI today is what you just saw. That their memories of a few years ago, sometimes longer ago, aren't true. And the way to do that was this campaign. Now you should know I tease them. So, now that we're finally targeting somebody who's older, you want me to be in the ad. And Troy, in his usual way, said, yes, you understand. You're older, and that's why you're there. <laughs> but the design was to remind people that we are Indianapolis' campus and Central Indiana's campus. And that's why it's always this welcome to Indianapolis in the billboards and why the commercials focus on what our students, faculty, and staff do to make us what we are. At IUPUI, serving the community is learning. IUPUI students and staff deliver more than 74,000 hours of service to different community agencies and schools. IUPUI, where impact is made every day. And we want to keep making an impact every day for you. Thank you.